Grant, nice to have you with us. No, happy to so be here. So let's start with the high performance conversation. What do you believe to be high performance? Um, tough question. Um, I think there's a lot of little things that go go into it. Um, I think first of all, you know, you've really got to have that hunger. Um, you've got to have something within you that gives you that drive. Um, I think as well, you know, you've really got to you look at the in football, look at the top, look at the lads that are right at the very top. They've all seemed to have that, you know, unbelievable self confidence. Um, so I think really belief is is a is a major factor in that. Um, and I think as well, um, you know, you've got to have you know a bit of honesty. You've got to be able to properly be honest with yourself, um, and you know, really be able to look at yourself in the mirror every day and um, you know judge yourself fairly. And do you have that self confidence? How do you get the balance between confidence and arrogance? Um, no, it is a fine balance, um, and you know, I think. It can sometimes be mistaken for arrogance. Sometimes it just is arrogance. Um, but I think uh, you know, it, is, it is a fine balance. But you know, I think you've got to really, you know, really believe in what you're doing. Really believe in the ability that you've got and and the work that you've got to put into it, that you've got to achieve what you want. And I think not just in in terms of sport, but I think in in life in general, and that you're. You've never really got to be, you know, happy and, and content um, unless you step up, unless you raise your standards, unless you keep looking to do better. So one of the things we've noticed, Grant, is that nobody sleepwalks into high performance. You don't, high performers don't find themselves there by accident. At some stage, they have to make a very deliberate commitment that they're going to go after their dreams or their ambitions. What age did you make that decision that you were going to go and pursue a life at the hard edge. Um, I think probably at a young age. I think. Well, I moved away from home at fourteen um, to play. I was playing for Crew Alexandra at the time. Um, so I think probably at that age, you know, moving away from home to to go into a you know purely football. That's probably the age of my life that I decided that's um, you know that's what it's got to be, and there was never any other option really. That's what it was. Um, but I think as you go along the way, you, you know, you learn so much. Um, you know, it's probably human nature as well, and that's the way life goes. But I think as as you get older, as you gain experience, um, you know, there's so, there's so much to learn. I think, you know, for me speaking personally, I'm you know, I'm 29 now, and uh, you know, I still feel like there's so much that I don't know, and so much that I'm you know really eager to learn about. So, what do you wish you would have known? That if the twenty nine year old you could have told the fourteen year old boy that moved away from home, what's the one thing that uh, the bit of information you'd have passed on? Probably um, what I touched on at the start there. I think um, for me, probably to be really honest with myself and really, um, you know, judge myself in a fair way and not look for sort of coping mechanisms to, to deal with tough situations. I think really to um to really realise that sometimes it's times to you've got to step up and you've got to you know, you've got to do more. Um and to get to the top you've got to be relentless. Um like you said, no one sort of sleepwalks into high performance and also I think as well you've got to really buy into that belief that um you've got what it takes and you're You've got the ability, you've got the desire, you've got the work rate, you've got you know all of those things to, to achieve your goal. We were joined by the explorer Nims Perger Grant on the podcast a few series ago, and he used the phrase, excuses remove the learning. So when you talk about assessing yourself and judging your own performances and your own commitment, what are the processes that you go through to decide whether you've done enough or not done enough? Um, I don't think there's really a... A process. I think um, you know whatever it is after a game or um, you know after a training session, you, you, you know yourself straight away. Straight away, you know. Um, there's obviously sort of a process after that where you you maybe look at your stats or you look at your data or you watch the game back and you get a, a better feeling for it or a better idea for it because um, 
you know, it's it's an emotional time. It's you're emotional after a game. You're maybe a little bit more angry about some things than you should be, or you're maybe more happy about some things than you should be. So, um, no, I think it does take a bit of time. But I think you know, deep down, you know yourself, and you know, I think as well the where it gets lost sometimes now is um, you know, I think people are always uh, looking for approval from elsewhere. Um, which for me, I think I've never really, I've never really searched for that. I feel like I've always been a pretty fair judger, um, you know myself. But I think there's only really, there's only really a few opinions that matter. Um, you know, obviously your manager's got to be one of them. Um, probably then your missus, your parents, your kids. But you know, I think deep down, there's only yourself really. You, you know yourself, um, whether. You're, uh, you know, you can be content, or whether there's more to do. So, what would you say then are the most common excuses that you do hear in dressing rooms of those that don't quite reach the heights? Well, there's been um, th- there's excuses, and obviously the, the probably the the most heard one is probably the manager. Then there's also the other things like injuries and stuff like that. Um, you know, whatever it may be, I think from my own experience and from what I've learned about myself when I've went through sort of tough times, you know, where I've, where I've not been playing or, um, you know, where I've struggled to get in the team or when I've been injured is, you know, I sort of told myself, well, I'm doing all that I can do. I'm, I'm training hard. I'm, um, you know, I'm training well, so it's not my problem sort of thing. The manager's not picking me. What, what can I do? Um, whereas looking back now, I probably never truly believed that, I should have been playing. That was sort of my coping coping mechanism to to get round the fact that I'm working hard. So you know it's not my problem. Um, but you hear all sorts. There's loads, and you know footballers sometimes get bad reputations, and a lot of the time it's wrong. But you know some of the times it's it's right. Um, like I said, the manager's normally one that you hear in dressing rooms, and you hear other things like, well, if they want me pay me all this money and I'll sit here and do nothing. Uh, no, that's fine by me, which which isn't right. You know, I don't I don't agree with that at all. And I'm never one that'll um sort of down tools. You know, where I've had tough times, I'll I'll never do that. I'll always do what's right for the team and what's best for the team and help however possible. But you know, the little things that I could have changed is um, you know, really being honest with myself and really um, you know, believing that that I, that I could make a difference. And what about being honest with other people? If you hear those excuses being made in and around the dressing room and the changing room. Tell us how you react to that. Damien talks about cultural architects, people that set the standard, set the tone at a football club. And I think that the, the messages that I've had from Stuart Webber and Daniel Farker and others is that you are a cultural architect at Norwich. So would you share with us how you go about your work? Um, again, I think uh, probably one of my strengths is, you know, saying exactly how I see it. Um, you know, I think probably what you see is what you get with me. Um, I think which has always been one of my strengths. You know, I tend to be honest with people, and I've not. I wouldn't be shy to, you know, to make my feelings known. Um, but saying that, you know, I think as as a captain that it's got to be done in the right way. You know, it's not it's not about going in and you know shouting and screaming and swearing at people if you know you're not happy. But at the same time, there's a, uh, you know, there's definitely circumstances where you know people need to be told and know in certain terms what what's expected of them um what the manager expects what the players expect but you know i think fortunately for me at norwich that they do really well in not signing arseholes and if they do sign an arsehole it doesn't last very long and why doesn't why doesn't he last very long um because it's people that are uh motivated the wrong way or don't fit into the, the culture that we've got at the club. Um, they're quickly found out. You know, there's no there's no hiding place. Um, like I said before, there is a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And if there was to be, you know, someone like that in the dressing room, they would they would get found out pretty quickly. And um, I mean, you know, Stuart and you know the boss as well. That's they, they won't stand for it, and uh, you know, it won't happen. Finding them out is one thing; dealing with it is another. So. How does that work as players? Do you is it a direct conversation? Is it quiet conversations? How, how does a football club deal with a person that doesn't fit? 
in your experience? Um, well, the manager here is, um, you know, I think first of all, your your attitude needs to be right. Your attitude needs to be right, and your um, sort of your mentality needs to be right. Um, and if that, he, he doesn't miss a thing. So first of all, you know, the manager will, will probably notice it before the players. You know, that's first of all. But like I said before, I think there's ways of dealing with. It. There's ways of speaking to people, and I think early on in uh, in my time at Norwich, um, there was someone that. I didn't agree with their, their attitude and I was probably over the top in how I dealt with it and the manager sort of told me that. He said, you were out of order, you shouldn't have done that. Whereas at the time I thought it was the right thing to do. And that, and I think that's part of uh, that's part of learning as well and that's part of, you know, growing as a, as a you know, just not just a player but as a person. Um, so no, luckily for me, you know, I've not had to deal with that in a while. Um, but I think if I did have to now, I'd you know, deal with it in a much sort of mellowed way um, and it would you know be, be it would be done properly but at the same time it's people know you know lads aren't daft and they'll they'll just not be accepted they won't be part of that group they'll they'll sort of feel as if they're you know not being uh, not being in with the lads if that makes sense so can I ask it from a different angle then Grant I mean like football's an industry that fascinates me because it's one of the few where Anybody that seems to stay behind and do extra training or do extra analysis, they have that horrible term where they call them busy. It's almost like the tall poppy syndrome of knock down anyone that looks like they're trying to improve or invest in their own talent. How do you nurture and encourage that mindset of people that are looking to improve and develop and protect them from those kind of jibes? I think, um, you know, lads that have got that mindset and that attitude then I don't think they, they care if they get it anyway and rightfully so so they, they shouldn't if they were to get you know as a bit of banter as they probably call it it, it doesn't affect them um, you know because th- their motivation is something that what does it matter if someone calls calls you busy and that's never something you really have to to deal with in a, in a dressing room I think that um you know there is there is a fair amount of banter that goes on, but lads that have got that mindset and that focus couldn't care less whether there was people saying they were busy or people saying they were doing too much or, or whatever it may be. That's that's just the way it is, and I think the the sort of mentality we we have at Norwich and how hard we train as well and how, and what the the manager demands of you, um, you know it's it's unbelievable the. The, the workload that we get through is I would never I dreamed I would be able to train like like a train other lads are probably probably similar um, and that's the way it is and that's that's the standards and at first you're probably a bit shocked by it and at first you're probably you know thinking what is this what's going on here but I think at the end of the day when when you get success and you feel like you're part of something that's going to be successful you know, you don't care. You don't care what people want to do. You don't care what, you know, the managers demand of you. You do it, no questions asked. And and that's it. So can you take us inside Colney, inside the Norwich City Training Ground, Grant, and explain, you know, just how different it is from the kind of training you would have experienced when you signed for Blackburn as a as a teenager? Just how intense is it under Daniel Farco? What a typical day looks like? Um... So when it when I when I think back, uh, um, when I first sort of got into a first team environment, you know it's a totally different world now. It is it's uh, you know it's scary. I was probably just got in the last of the older generation, if that makes sense. Um, you know I had some proper uh, old school professionals in in the dressing room, lads like David Dunn, uh, Keith Andrews, Jason Roberts. Ryan Nelson, Vince Grella, lads like that, uh, Paul Robinson, that were um, you know proper old school, and they sort of set the standards, and that was it. Um, but training was, uh, you know, thinking back, probably a, a bit of an old school British training regime where it was winning a Saturday, you're off Sunday, Monday, train Tuesday, off Wednesday, uh, train Thursday, Friday, play Saturday. Whereas now it's you'll get a Monday off and that's probably about it. Um, 
Tuesday's a, a long session, a tough session. Wednesday's a double session. Thursday's a bit lighter. And then you step up, back up again, going into the game on Saturday. Sunday, you're in for a, for a recovery and, and a sort of debrief. The manager will, will uh, you know, fairly often go through video of the, the game the day before. Um, and I think, again, that's... It's every detail is, is looked at. You know, there's no stone left unturned. And I think I've never spent as much time in a meeting room in my career. Um, you know, I'm not sure there'll be any team in the country that spend more time in an analyst room. And again, like I said, at first you're you're thinking, what's going on here? But it's a norm now. It's a norm, and that's the standards that the manager's set. And um, because it's becoming a norm, because the lads are buying into it, um, it's accepted, and it's it's that's what success takes. And that's you know that's how committed you need to be, and that's uh, that's how much you need to give if you want to be successful. And what about team spirit, though? Because there's some people listening to this that would say, you know, like some of those old school mentalities of, of investing in the team spirit have been lost to the expense of analysis and data. What would your response to that be, Grant? Um, I think in terms of team spirit, I think it's changed a lot. I think my perception of it has changed a lot. I think when I was young, I thought, I probably thought um, team spirit is all the lads going out for a beer together on a Saturday night. And don't get me wrong, I think at the right time, I think that's still a massive, uh, you know, a massive part of the, the culture. I know there's there's some teams where they absolutely hate the manager, but the lads all go out together every weekend and they're successful because of that. So I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying at Norwich, that is not the way team spirit works. Um you know, I think um, very rarely will the lads, you know, have a, a night out together, whether it's whether it's Christmas or whatever, Christmas do or, or whatever. But I think team spirit sort of changed now. I think team spirit is, um, you know, that mentality you've got in the dressing room, um, the, the attitude you've got, you know, how hard you're willing to work for each other. Um, and, you know, going out on a Saturday, you know, you look around and you know, Every single person on that pitch knows exactly what their job is, you know exactly what's required, um, and having that belief in the team that, um, you know, knowing the team never knows when they're beaten, you're always got to fight for each other, and you're always got to back each other up, whatever happens. Um, so I think my sort of perception and team spirit has changed and shifted, and it'll be. I think it'll be different in every dressing room. So and to take that, I'm interested. Go on, I mean, yeah, crack on. Well, I was no, going to ask said about about the same principle then at international level, if we transfer it, because you have the time to build cohesion and that trust on the training ground when you're in a club. How do you accelerate that process when you bring an international team together? It's hard. It's difficult to to um, to answer that question because it's, uh, it is very difficult because obviously your, your time spent away with internationals, you know, normally... 10, 11 days. Um, but I think because of the, you know, the common interest uh, and the pride of playing for your national team, I think that probably plays a big part in it. Um, you know, speaking for Scotland, I know how proud all the lads are to go away and, you know, that's what you're fighting for. You're fighting for your country. Um, so I think that probably helps. But, you know, it's important. Remember the lads are away and they're in the hotel for 10 days altogether. So you spend a lot of time with, uh, together as well, so that probably helps to, um, you know, accelerate that that process. But again, it's it's um, you know, it's team spirit's always easy when when you're successful. I think um, you know people probably overlook that and and don't and don't realise that. But um, you know, that's a, that's obviously a big part of it as well. When you when your team's successful and you're doing well, it's you know, it's easy for the team spirit to be good. But you know, as we've learned at Norwich over the last year or so, it's um, you know, it's when the tough time comes. That's when you, that's when you really see, you know, what uh, what the team spirit's like. So, what did you learn then about yourself and the players around you? Um, and we'll talk about the brilliant promotion you've enjoyed this season. Let's first of all talk about the relegation. When we had Stuart Weber on the podcast, he said that he knew with quite a few games to go that Norwich were down, and in his head, he'd already made 
he sort of he said he grieved for the fact that Norwich had been relegated, and it was already an excitement about being successful in the championship. When did you feel that it was inevitable, and how did you deal with it? It, it was difficult for me. It was really difficult for me because I missed the last uh, nine or ten games after uh, you know after the restart, and for you know the biggest disappointment for, from a selfish point of view was. I feel like I'd been playing well and I feel like I'd finally found a bit of fitness and a bit of form. Um, you know, so that that was frustrating. And also it's it's frustrating, you know, being a senior player and being being a captain and seeing the lads, you know, go through what they went through in the last 10 games and, uh, you know, really disappointing. Um, considering that I know we were, you know, we were bottom of the table before the restart, but we felt like we were never never too far away. Um, we felt like we always had a chance in games. I think there was maybe only sort of two or three games where we were blown away. You know, it wasn't like we were battered every week. Um, so for me to miss out on, you know, a, a time and a stage where the lads were really struggling, they looked, they looked defeated. They looked, they looked beat. Um, you know, where I feel like maybe I had a little bit extra to give or a little bit of experience where. You know, I could have affected it, and I and I think um, I'm not saying for one second if I'd have been playing, we'd have stayed up. That's not what I'm saying, but I think I could have affected the 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 mentality of the lads going into the games. I think I could have affected the attitude, um, you know, of the team as a whole, which is, you know, which was was disappointing for me. And I think, obviously, I can't remember when, um, you know, I'd accepted it, but you know, it was, you know, it certainly was with, you know. A decent amount of games to go. And what changed then in that period between pre-shutdown, when we all felt like Norwich were involved and they were given a good account of themselves, even if they were battling relegation, and then after the shutdown, when when Norwich returned and and didn't pick up a win, I'm sure you've all had this conversation internally. What have what have you come to the conclusion? Oh, it's hard. It's hard to put your um, to put your finger on the answer to that. Um, and still, I don't. I don't really think anyone ever will ever know. But you know, for me, in, in my opinion on it, it looked as if the the belief had gone a little bit. It looked like like the lads didn't really believe that we had it in us to to achieve what we needed to achieve. Um, and that's sore. You know, that's sore to take as as a player. That's sore to um, to see you know your teammates ex- accepting that and that that was tough to take but it's the same again when you ask the question what was the difference this year how did we turn that around i don't know the answer to that i don't know what the answer is but you know i've got a good idea in terms of the mentality and it coming right from the top of the club and the sort of standards that are set and the people that we have around the club um you know every everybody's good people the whole club is full of you know the right person in the right place with the right attitude. Um, like I said before, there's no, there's no assholes. There's no egos. You know, it, it just doesn't stand. Um, and I think that goes a long way. That goes a long way in in terms of, um, you know, getting that mindset and getting that attitude to, to, be successful. And I think a lot of it is as well as sometimes football's unfair, um, and sometimes I think. You know, you've really got to force it and you've got to, you know, go and, go and take what you deserve. And what was what was done internally to make sure that there was no hangover from that relegation in this promotion season? I mean, has it even has it even been mentioned? How did Stuart and Daniel bring everyone together to put a full stop before the promotion season started? N- nothing major. It wasn't like... Um... It sounds like you want me to tell tell you there was a big meeting and we had a crisis meeting, whatever. There was nothing like that. Um, there was nothing like that. That was uh, that was sort of never mentioned. We had obviously had a, a meeting with the manager where it was honest and you know he gave his views and and where it went wrong. But you know from a from a player's point of view, I think the football as a footballer it moves quick, and I think you've um, you've got to. You've got to, you know, change your mindset quickly, um, and I think that happened pretty early this season. And I think, um, 
you know, there was a couple of lads that were left out for a, for a period of time because their attitude wasn't wrong. And, you know, I think that was a, the manager setting a marker to say, this is what is expected and I don't care who you are. Um, which some people probably thought at the time, that's crazy, but it's worked. You know, look, you look at the performances of the lads that, you know, that have, uh, that, that we're speaking about, they were unbelievable. You know, they're unbelievable. Um, you know, for the remaining the remaining games of the season, so um, that's it. And I think, like I said, I think that's that's the standard the the club sets, and that's um, that's the ethos, and that's the culture that's there. Um, and and we know that that the most difficult part about getting relegated is is changing the mentality from being underdogs every week to switching it to being the favourites every week, and the pressure being on. Um, and we had, we did have a bit of a slow start. Um, but I think after that, you know, we, we really kicked on. And I think the the most impressive thing for me was whenever we went in a run where we won five or six games, or I think one of the runs we went on was nine games. It was always after we had a disappointing result. If um, you know if that makes sense, it was always after. I think of the when we got beat at Swansea. I think we had a couple of draws, and then we got beat at Swansea. I, you know, after that game, we we really went on, and that probably that probably won us the league. That probably what went. In, got us promotion, um, you know, how we were able to bounce back after that result. So Grant, would you tell us about what you did differently in your role from being an underdog to then being the expected uh, winner? What was the difference in terms of your approach? Um, that's, that's difficult to say. I mean, I think I probably had a period of time where I needed to be, you know, really honest with myself and, and change a um, you know, a, f- a few of my thought processes um, and how I was going to approach stuff. And I think as a as a captain, that's that's just, you know a major part of your role. Um, you know, it is a young dressing room. Um, and when I think about how I behaved when I was, you know, the age of some of the lads in the dressing room, I wouldn't have had a clue what to do. So I think it's important to, as a captain, you can't be a flapper. You know, you can't go in and be shitting your pants and be nervous every day. You know, you need to, it's important how you carry yourself and it's a, it's important how much your behaviours affect the, the rest of the group. Um, so no, I think it's very important to be calm. It's very important to be, you know, look like um, you know what you're doing, basically. So I think that was that was important for me and that was that was important for me to, to really... Um, you know, believe in that as well. I've touched on it before. For to, for me to really believe in, this is what I'm going to be this season, and you know, nothing's going to stop us being that. So, can I ask you then that if that if we believe that confidence comes from the evidence that we're capable of doing something, how are you going to tackle some of the mental scars of going back into the Premier League, where your last experience for you and for the team was so bruising? What what ideas would you do differently this time? Well, I think um, you know that that's a big part of, of sport in general, and, and probably and probably life. Um, I think what you're touching on there is, you know, having having a, a bit of fear about what we're going into, or uh, maybe feeling a bit inferior. And you know, I've certainly learned, you know, over time that, you know, that is totally. Worthless, and that has no that has no value in your in your mindset. Um, but I think it at times, you know, it is. I keep saying it's important to be honest, but I think it's important to be, you know, vulnerable at the same time. I think it's important to, you know, have times where you're, you know, you're scared of something or you're you're thinking about whatever it is, and you know, get that out and speak about it. I mean, obviously, that needs to be spoken about and whoever it is you, you need to speak, whether it's family or friends or whatever. I mean, me personally, I, you know, as a senior player, I can't be going in and saying to lads, fucking hell, I'm shit myself for next season. What if, what if we're shit again? Do you know what I mean? That needs to be, that needs to be something that you need to, you know, deal with yourself. And then after that, you know, once, once they're put to the side, I think you've got to think to yourself, why not? What's stopping us? What is, what is stopping us from going, doing ourselves justice, and being the best we can be, um, and that's I think that's probably going back to uh, you know some of the the um, the high performance stuff we spoke about there. 
Um, I think it's it's a mindset about being the best version you can possibly be yourself. Um, and I think that's you know that's part of the ethos of the club as well. That's the kind of people that are in place at the club, um, and that's the mentality that all the lads have. And and uh, we're a little bit more experienced this time. You know, the lads have been there and done it and experienced uh, when it's tough. So you know, I think my attitude is 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 why not and what is stopping us. We interviewed a guy called Chris Voss, who was an FBI hostage negotiator, Grant, and he actually articulated what you've just said there about sometimes just by labelling an emotion, a negative emotion, takes the sting out of it for people that once you can say, you know, we've been bruised last time or we're a little bit fearful of what we're about to go into, suddenly you can own that emotion and therefore do something about it. He, he describes burying it is where the, is where the real problems lie. Yeah, no, I agree. Like I said, I think it's important to be to be vulnerable at times and 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 to speak about it and to say, look, I'm I'm feeling this. Um, you know, I think probably an example footballers can relate to is you know maybe making a mistake at the weekend and then shitting yourself all week in case you make the same mistake the week after. And you know, you've got to deal with it and you've got to put it to bed. And you've what is the point? What is the point thinking about it? What is the point of thinking? Oh, maybe the manager will drop me because of that. I think you're you're you've got to be you've got to be clear in your mindset. I think there's enough uh, there's enough chaos in the world for you know you need a bit of clarity in your own head and what you want to achieve and what you want to do. Um, and I think that uh, you know that is definitely sort of my attitude towards it. How long would a 21 year old Grant Hanley have dwelled on a negative moment in a game or a mistake in a game? And how long does a 29-year-old Grant Hanley dwell on it? Um, seems like a long time ago, that. Um, no, probably, probably a while. Probably a while. And looking back and really thinking about it, I think it probably would have affected me. And to the point where I probably even wouldn't have wanted to speak about it because it would have uh, you know, probably affected me emotionally. Um, but now I think... You've got to look at it that we're, you know, we're all humans. We all make mistakes, um, and that's that's part of life. But there's no point in dwelling on it. You know, it's uh, for the next day or so. Yeah, obviously, be a bit pissed off for yourself, but as soon as possible, put it to bed and um, get on with the job that's in front of you. It sounds to me like you have learned the power of talking about the negative as well as the positive, and I imagine. Those dressing rooms a decade ago, talking about the negative was just something that didn't happen, whereas it's encouraged now in the modern game. Tyro Mings joined us and he, he told us that he, he speaks to a psychologist before every game, just one quick phone call. What Do you do anything similar? Yeah, something something very similar. And it was um, probably worked to this guy for a year and a half, a couple of years now. Um and it's it's really impressive. It's it's really impressive that the, you know, the sort of the, the stuff that we go through, and it's it's mainly about you know challenging my mindset, um, trying to change my mind, mindset, and um, you know, like like I keep saying, being vulnerable and, and it, being okay to talk about things that are um, you know that are that are worrying you or any of the fears that you've got, um, and I think the main objective is that. Is to be, um, you know, the best version of yourself. Do everything you can to be the best version of yourself, and 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 that's not just, that's just not football related. I think that's in life in general. You know, I think you need to get rid of negative habits. You need to have positive habits. You need to have a positive mindset, and you need to. Part of that's not wasting a day. You know, every day has got to be um, a day where you take your opportunity to improve. A day where you take your opportunity to be, you know, a better person. Um, and you know I've enjoyed it I've learned a lot and like I said I probably couldn't have done this podcast a couple of years ago because I never really knew and I still don't know don't get me wrong I'm still you know miles away from uh, being an expert on the subject but you know some of the stuff really really sticks with me and really you know I feel like it makes a difference so can you give us an understanding of, of how your work with the psychologist works is is he asking you for answers and helping you find them or is he giving you answers? Um, like I said, he challenges me. Um, 
he challenges me to to find the answers myself and he helps me along the way. Um and it's not something that we it's not something that I needed to do because you know I was lower in a snake's belly, do you know what I mean? It's something that I did because I was looking for a, a couple of extra percent in my career to you know, improve a bit. Um but but I think the main point is it's it's we don't it's not some someone that I speak to every day. We speak regular. We'll speak, you know, before games. Um, we'll have a debrief after games. He'll set little tasks and stuff for us to do. Um, but I think that you know the main the main point of it is 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 really about you know stepping up and realizing what it takes. Um, and at the end of the day, what you need to do and what you need to achieve to be you know content and happy in life. So to be crude about it then, Grant, how many percentage points do you feel this uh, this relationship has has gained has improved yet? I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't. Uh, you know, I wouldn't like to to put a number on that and, and try and measure that. All I know is that it's um, I enjoy it and it's you know it's definitely worthwhile and uh, you know he's very good at what he does. You know, I think it's interesting though, and I, I think it's brilliant to be having these kinds of conversations. We spoke similarly with Tyra Mings. We had a similar conversation with Stephen Gerrard and the pain he went through after the slip against Chelsea. Frank Lampard discussed it with us as well. Um, Gareth Southgate talks really openly about the conversations that the England players are having and the importance of a psychologist. But even now, like when we're talking about it, I still sense you sort of you still feel like a slight need to just excuse it a little bit, like. Um, I didn't feel I necessarily needed it, but it's helpful. Like, is there a full acceptance of this yet in football? Or is there still, even when you have these kinds of conversations, that tiny voice in the back of your mind and other players going, oh, what are people going to think about this? Because from the perspective of myself and Damien, this is like only a positive thing. There's nothing negative that can come out of these conversations you're having with a psychologist. Yeah, no, I think like from, from my point of view... Um... I couldn't really care less what anyone thinks anyway, so it's you know, it's not something that I'm trying to hide from or I'm trying to um you know, I'm trying to shy away from, but at the same time I think you're right in what you say and it's it's a conversation that's not openly had in, in dress rooms. You'll never hear any of the lads um you know, sort of advertising the fact that they're doing this stuff. Which I think, you know, it's a shame really because it's such a big part of the game and it's I know from my experience, it's made such a difference, you know, to my to my life in general, and um, you know, also on the pitch. Um, so, you know, for me, it's 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 very important, and it's it's probably been, you know, the the little bit of difference that's um, you know helped me improve. I want to go back to um, when you first became a captain, because you were in your early twenties. Do you think you did something specific where a manager looked at you and thought he's captain material? Um, it's something that I'd done from a young age, sort of growing up with uh, boys clubs and, you know, local teams and stuff. It always seemed like, uh, I was a captain. Um, I'm not really sure. I was always an organiser on the pitch. I was always an organiser. Um, and I was never shy of giving my opinion and I was never shy of telling people how, exactly how it was. Um, but obviously being made... Captain at, at twenty two, um, you know, looking back now, it was it was probably the wrong decision. Um, not on my because. behalf, obviously, on the on the manager's behalf, um, because Why I was nowhere that? near ready. It was um, it probably happened by default for the state of the the club was in at the time. Blackburn was really struggling, um, and I was probably you know the only real option. I was playing every week. I was playing well. Um, there was all sorts going on, so I got it. And like I said at the time when I got it, you know, I was over the moon. I was so proud, and I was, um, I thought this is unbelievable. I'm 22, 23, whatever it was, and I'm, you know, I'm captain of a club like Blackburn Rovers. I couldn't believe it, but you know, looking back, I never had a clue what I was doing. I never had a clue what I was doing, but you know, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it because you know that experience and you know the amount I learnt from that was, uh, you know, it's unbelievable. What did you learn? I think I learned how to deal with people and I think I learned how I need to carry myself. I learned how I need to behave. Um, 
I think at a young age, I probably thought through insecurities that I need to sort of stamp a bit of authority and um, that was probably the wrong way to judge it. Um, I, I think about how I try and behave now and, and, and try and act and you know, I think about lads that have, have been captains. I look at lads like uh, Russell Martin, um, you know, how he carries himself. You know, he's, he's a true gentleman, Russell, and he's, you know him, Jake, you can probably vouch for that as well. And, you know, just how he handles himself and how he carries himself in the dressing room and how he, um, you know, wants to be the best for everybody in there. Um, you know, it's lads like that that you you really learn from. Um and I think that's a, a big part of it as well. I know everybody's got a different style, but you know I think um, Darren Fletcher as well with Scotland. You know, seeing people like that that were so humble and um, you know so down to earth and done everything they possibly could for for the lads in the dressing room. I definitely learned a lot from them. I think the best definition I've heard on the series we've done, Grant, has been when we interviewed uh, Kevin Sinfield, that was a captain at twenty two of Leeds Rhinos in rugby league. And he said that he saw it as his job to help other people be better. How good were you at making other people better when you were a captain? At that age? Yeah. Zero. That was And now? That no, yeah, no I would say. No I would say it's one it's one of my So how did you keep how did you keep this captaincy then if you if you now reflect on it as the fact that you weren't ready? Uh, I improved. I got better. Um I think I can remember I, I got it and the lads came to me and said, right, we need to go and have a chat with uh, um, whoever it was at the time about the bonuses and stuff like that. And I thought, what the fuck is that? Like, <laughs> what, what, what do I need to do? Do you know what I mean? Um, and obviously you learn and you, you pick up experience as you go. And now I would probably say, I'm, you know, I've got a better idea on what, what I'm doing and, you know, in that terms of things. But, um, you know, I wouldn't change it. Like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. I don't know why... Why I kept it probably because I was playing and I was playing well, um, but that that that's it. That's it. And like I said, I wouldn't change it. I've I've learned so much from it, and I'm you know I'm grateful that the manager made that decision at the time. And I always think that we learn a lot more in the bad times than we do in the good times. So, what was the biggest thing you learned from that difficult period at Newcastle that has sustained you and and helped you to move forward? Um. I probably didn't learn it at the time. It's probably now looking back and, you know, a few years down the line being able to uh, reflect on it. Um, I think it was it was tough for me because it was, you know, probably the first time in my career that I'd, um, you know, had a bit of rejection. Um, I got there and I started the first game of the season and I wasn't in the squad the next week. And for me, that was like, you know, mind-boggling. I couldn't believe what was going on. Um, and as I said earlier, I think my coping mechanism with that was, well, I'm training well, and I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm helping as much with the lads and that, and I'm, I'm trying to be there for everybody. I think that was my sort of coping mechanism to say, well, it's not my problem. The manager doesn't pick me. What, what else can I do? Sort of thing. Where I think from pretty early on in my time at Newcastle, um, I was going through the motions. Really, I'd never really believed that I was got to get myself in the team at any point. And I think whenever I played, it was only because of injuries. It wasn't because I, I never earned my place in the team. Even when um, they first signed you, because you know, they paid good money for you. When you first arrived, you must have believed, no? Well, I, th- well, I, thought, I thought I'd cracked it. I thought I'm going to sign for Newcastle. I'm going to play every week in the championship. We've got to get promoted. Um, and my career's going to go upwards. And obviously that wasn't to be. And... You know, it was tough to take. And like I said, the, the type of person I am, I would never, I'm never one to down tools and I'm never one to, I never like to look for excuses. Um, you know, so I, the manager was never really one that I was going to fall out with or, you know, have an argument with. Um, but but my coping mechanism was to, to say it's not my fault, really. You know, I'm doing all I can do. But then looking back and I think, if I was a manager, I probably wouldn't have played me either. Really? Yeah. Well, that's like I said. I never, I never had that belief. I never really had that drive to think I can do this. I can get in this team. Um, you know, which which is which is sad for me. And it's 
it was probably tough for me to say for a long time, but um, you know that that's the way it was. I still think if I got in the team and um, got a run of games, that would have changed. But really deep down, I didn't do enough to probably earn that. I think that's um, incredible honesty. Um, and it shows how far you've come on your journey of kind of acceptance, really, of, of what you've been through. But I'm surprised no one there looked at a young player who'd got a big move and was at the biggest club he'd ever played at and thought, just need to put our arm around him and just let him know that he is good enough. Because if we give him the self-belief, then we'll find the true Grant Hanley. That yeah, no, I think, it, and as well, I probably had a had a bit of a bluff on because I was, I'm never one to sulk. I'm never one to come in and feel sorry for myself and let people know and feel sorry for myself. I was always coming in and, you know, pretty lively with the lads, having a laugh and a joke and, and whatever it may be. Um, and I remember the, the manager always used to, he used to want me having to be in the dressing room for games um, because he said I was good I was good for the lads. And at some points I kind of thought, that's a little bit of an insult really. I don't, I don't want to be here to be good for the lads. You know, I want, I want to be playing. Um, you know, so at times that was tough. That was tough to take as well. But um, and I think it was. You would never really. Th- I could get away with it because my bluff was I'm lively, I'm working hard, I'm training well. But really, I never, I never had that belief that I was going to get myself in the team, which I think was my. Um, you know, I think was probably my failure, and I think now I would deal with. It a lot differently in terms of how I would approach every day and how I would have that belief that why not, what's stopping me. And what about your mental health at that time, Grant? Because the way you describe it of you having to go in and put on almost a mask when you're in that environment and yet you must have been struggling in different ways, in like whether it's that belief that you had that you deserve to be there. How did you take care of your mental health during that time? No, my mental health was fine. There was never any, there was never any issues for that. I mean, that was. Um, I mean, I know, it, you know, and today there's obviously a lot of issues with stuff like that, and people need to talk about it. And but there was never any mental health. It was more, it was more my personal pride that was probably hurt because, like I said, I was, it was my first experience of really having that bit of rejection. So it was probably my, my pride that took a bit of a whack. Um, in terms of that, and that was probably the hardest part, for, you know, for me. But um, I think in terms of going in every day to training, I had no problem with that. That was, um, you know, being a footballer, I think you've got to appreciate that you're going to work. Um, so I think, you know, I, I love going into training. I love being at Newcastle. I loved going in and seeing the lads and having a laugh and working hard. But um, you know, that wasn't where my issue lied. Like one of the things I've really admired in terms of what you've said. Uh, in this uh, discussion, Grant, has been that you don't really seem to care what other people say about you. You know, like, I'm sure you go into dressing rooms like I do where after a game you see young boys sat on social media immediately after the whistle's blown or they sat on the bus like looking for validation from strangers in many ways. How, How did you learn not to care? Because I think that's a real skill that you can pass on to our listeners and to others? Um, no, it's tough to put my finger on the real answer for that. And I think it's um, it's the world we live in today and that's you're never going to change it. And for a lot of reasons, I can agree with the social media stuff and I can see the benefits from it. But I can also see massive negatives. Um, I mean, I'm not on social media. Um, so, And I think for me, I don't need... However many people tell me that they think I'm shit, and at the same time, I don't, I don't really need. However many people tell me I've had a good game or that they think I'm a great player, um, I mean, that's never really been in, in my thought process. Um, I think. But why back not? My... What was what I'm intrigued about is like, the, um, like what in your development stopped you needing that validation? Because so many people do, by the way, Grant, and you'll see it from the no, I know, I know, and it's. I know that a lot of lads have got an issue with that, and I see, I've seen firsthand how much it affects players. Um, I, I, it's not how I avoided that. It's I just can't understand it. I don't understand why you would need people that probably haven't got a clue about football telling you that you, you've done this or you've done that or you're good or you're bad or whatever. Um, 
And I think probably, fortunately for me, I've always been the one that's um, really known. It's only really me that matters. It's only really my judgment that really um, that really matters to me. Like I said, there's obviously a couple more. There's, you know, um, the manager, first of all. Um, but then after that, it's probably only really, you know, my parents and their their football knowledge is very limited as it is anyway, so you can take that with a pinch of salt. But I think deep down at the end of the day, if you can, um, if if you're content with how you've done, or you know that you need to do a little bit more, that's all that really matters. And you know, I think players can probably take a bit from that and maybe learn to shut out a bit of the stuff that that they receive on show, social media because I know it's a problem, and I think lads become addicted to it. They can't wait to get in and check if people think they've done well or done bad. And like I said, that's the people that are writing these things to them. They're the they're the least of their worries. They, they shouldn't be. That's not who they need to impress. Um, and it affects lads. It affects lads massively. So, and I don't know what the answer is to, to tell them to stop doing it. But um, and do you tell them if you see someone on the on their phone ten seconds after a game? You like come on. I'll it tell you, it's, it's, it's not, that's not the, the problem where, because they're looking at what people are saying about them, it's more the fact that um, you shouldn't be on your phone anyway, you know, it might be something that we need to talk about, um, which is, but that's, that's the, uh, that's the world we live in today and it's, um, that's the way it always be, I don't think you'll change it. I've, I've so enjoyed having this conversation because I think it's, we've sort of gone on the journey of acceptance of yourself and football and an understanding and you know we talk often on this podcast about a growth mindset and it's clear that you've grown so much from that young lad that signed for Blackburn to be captaining a team back in the Premier League and playing for your country at, at the Euros I mean this is without question the most exciting point in your career are you playing the best football of your career yeah I'd say so yeah I think that's only natural I don't think that's um for any other reason that, you know, I'm becoming more experienced and I'm learning more. I think that's human nature and that's not one that there's a um, there's an answer for, really. I think that's just, I'm fit and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hungry to go and achieve more. See, I disagree with what you've just said there, Grant. I think that, like, I'm sure like you, I know lots of stupid old people and I love lots of really smart young people. I don't think experience gives you wisdom. I think experience plus reflection gives you wisdom. And I think what Jake's saying there is you've done plenty of reflecting on yourself. You've been pretty honest in your own self-assessment. And I think that's the bit that is so valuable. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And I think that's obviously a massive part of it as well. Um, but I think there's... A big part of that as well is is you've got to stay hungry. You know you've got to you've got to keep that whatever it is inside you that drive to um, to keep improving. Because I think the second you lose that, then I think you're wasting your time. We're talking of hunger. You're at a major tournament with Scotland. How do you balance the expectation with um, not letting that overawe you over the summer? By the time people listen to this, um, you will already be at the Euros. Who knows? what the results will be, what will be going on. But ahead of this tournament, give us an insight into into your mindset for what's going to be the biggest summer of your career. Well, I think, it's again, it's probably um, my own personal way of looking at it is that it's great that we're there. Obviously, it's unbelievable for the nation. It means so much to the, to the supporters. Um, but you've got to not make it bigger than what it is. It's another game of football. Um, obviously unbelievably important but I think for um, for experiences like this because they're so big and you build them up so much in your head they can pass you by I think it's important to be to be present I think you've got to be there and you've got to live it and you've got to you know be there for that experience I think being present in that moment will be so important and I think that's probably the only way that we'll or anybody, any player that's going to the Euros will perform. So that is like the, the classic phrase is play the game, not the occasion. So I think we know, given that your reluctance to engage on social media will help you dial down that noise, but how will you help your teammates focus on the game and not the occasion, Grant? 
Um, again, I think that's um, there's probably some more senior lads in the team that will take that responsibility on. But again, that's um, you know, as a senior player, that's for me, that's how you carry yourself. Um, you know, I think you've got to. If you look calm, everybody will think you're calm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think you've got to show that confidence and that, um, you know, that belief in what you're doing, and that's you know something that's really in, impressed me with with the manager. You know, since I got back into the Scotland squad, that was, you know, I've heard him saying it on numerous occasions. We've got to believe. We've got to believe that we're good enough to mix it with these teams, and we're good enough to beat these teams. Um, which, for me, obviously, as I've spoke today, you 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 realise that's uh, you know that's a big part of my mindset. So interesting. Listen, Grant, we've reached the point of the podcast where we do our quick fire questions. So we start with three non negotiable behaviours that people around you have to buy into. What are your three most important things? Uh, probably I'll give you the same answer again here. I think honesty, yeah. belief, hunger, drive. What's one piece of advice that you'd give a teenage Grant just starting out on his journey? Um, that is a tough one. That is a tough one because I feel like I want to give you the same answer again. I think it's... Um, I don't know because I'm a big believer in experiences and I think that's everything that's happened in my career has led me to the point that I'm in today and I think you know, I've learned so much along the way um, and, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for that and I think that there's not much I would say apart from, you know, just be relentless, just keep going, never give up and believe in what you're doing. So is there any space in your life for regret? Not really. I think once it's done, it's done. I think once, uh, you know, whatever happens has happened and I've, I've mentioned it before, but, you know, your fears and your and your worries and, I mean, it, you don't want to be living in the past. I just said there, you've got to be present and, you know, I think that's so important for, you know, not just football, but life in general. Um, you know, you've got to live in the here and now, and uh, you know, I'm a big believer in that. Your biggest strength and your biggest weakness? Biggest strength? Um, Modesty. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, go with that. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, biggest weakness? Um... Probably overcritical at times. Um, you know, that's something that I've had to overcome is, you know, I, I keep talking about being honest with yourself and really judging yourself in a fair way, but sometimes I've been, you know, I've been overcritical and I've probably dwelled on things where, you know, as I've learned, you know, that it needs to be, you know, put to bed and um, you need to move on. And finally, Grant, your, your golden rule to living a high-performance life? Golden rule? Um, no, I think you've got to, you've got to never miss an opportunity to improve. You know, every day is a chance to, uh, to better yourself, and you know, I think you've, you've got to squeeze every ounce of potential that you've got inside you. Um, you know, and that's that's different for everyone. Um, you know, you've got to set yourself goals, realistic goals, um, and make the most of what you've got um, because it's worth it. Wonderful. What a great way to end. And listen, I've found that such an interesting conversation because I, I, I can see the progression from where it started at Blackburn and the potential mindset you had there to the way it is now at Norwich. And I think that you clearly don't really have an ego. So you can, you, in your head, you sort of say, oh, well, I've just sort of ended up now at Norwich playing for Scotland. But everything's happened for a reason. And there is a reason why you've ended up back in the Premier League, captaining a club and playing for your country. And it is because you have just grown massively on, on your journey within football. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with that. I agree with that. And it's, um, you know, like you just said there, like I'm, I'm modest and I find it difficult talking about myself at, myself at times and talking about qualities and stuff. Um, but it's been so interesting for me. And so, you know, I feel like, especially in the last couple of years, I've learned so much. Um, and I think where I'm, I'm lucky is, you know, I've always been... I've always been able to fight. That's probably been my biggest strength, my determination, um, you know, and, and never quitting and being able to, you know, being able to have a bit of a scrap with whatever's going on. Um, so, you know, to, to, to have that and not be the most gifted technically, 
are gifted with talent and ability like the rest of the lads are. You know, I think that probably helps me as well in terms of they maybe see what I've done with my limited talent and ability. And I think that should be sort of a motivation to, you know, see some of the lads. The amount of talent these lads have got these days, the young lads, is it's frightening. And, uh, you know, I think if they've got the right attitude and the right mindset and that, that sort of fighting mentality, you know, I think they can, you know, do whatever they want. Top man. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no problem, thanks, boys. Man. I don't underestimate. It takes balls to do what you do when you're still playing and sharing some of this stuff. So uh, thank you. It is. It's usually grateful and really, really humbling. No, brilliant. Enjoyed it. Thanks, mate. Please hit subscribe. Hit the notification bell. Give us a thumbs up. Leave a review. But somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.